السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to our fifth virtual webinar. Uh, today, the topic is health economics in the time of COVID-19. The need to push the reset button. It's my pleasure and honor for me to welcome Dr. Al-Malki. Dr. Ziad Al-Malki is an assistant professor of health economics and the clinical outcome research and the head of clinical pharmacy department at Ben Sattam Ben Abdul Aziz University in Saudi Arabia. He is also a member in the National Advisory Committee of Health Economics at Saudi Health Council. Dr. Malki is an experienced researcher in health economics and the clinical outcome research with a demonstrated history of in designing and executing outcomes research using different database with most advanced data analysis techniques. Please welcome uh, Dr. Ziad to start his presentation. Welcome, Dr. Ziad. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. It's Mr. Fadah. Confirmation. Uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Najwa and entire team in the Healthcare Activities Academy uh, for the um, invitation and uh, organizing this webinar. And also, I want to welcome every uh, one of the folks who joined me today to talk about the health economics uh, in the current uh, days. Uh, I will try to skip the introduction because I only have 20 minutes. Um, by the way, uh, we'll try to, to not miss any, any uh, important information. I have no financial disclosure conflicts for interest uh, with the business material on this presentation. Um, as you all know that at the end of uh, 2019, uh, the WHO regional office um, received some information about new cases of pneumonia. Um, and uh, on the 7th of January, actually, these cases were identified as the cause of uh, one uh, type of coronavirus and later on was named as uh, COVID-19. Uh, the symptoms was varied between very mild, no symptoms to very mild to severe um, uh, symptoms. And um, the, the origin, so it was, it was believed it was originated from the uh, animal and uh, seafood market in Yuhan and China. So uh, then it was recognized as a pandemic uh, in March uh, 2020. Uh, so all the, you know, the body should try to um, uh, collaborate with all experts and uh, partners around the world to find a gap, uh, the gaps and to find solution to slow down the spread of this virus. Uh, most countries uh, have taken a lot of measures, control measures to uh, slow down the measure, you know, the spread of this virus. Um, it was very between low level uh, control measure to very high level control measures. Um, but we can categorize these measures into uh, three categories, uh, regular epidemiology, uh, epidemiological control and prevention measures. Uh, this was basically what the country do in normal um, in daily basis when they identify any infectious uh, condition. Uh, we'd like to uh, identification of the infected cases, uh, tracing the close contacts, quarantines, and the second category is city activity restrictions, uh, which include uh, work from home, shut down schools, public university, colleges, and uh, cancellation of some events. And the third category included the um, what they call intercity travel restrictions, which is basically a cancellation of the uh, flights um, from between cities and between countries. So the category two and three are uh, considered to be irregular because they don't do that normally and it's usually very aggressive. So when we talk about the economic impact, I know you you get fed up actually with economic impact. A lot of speakers, a lot of health economics talk about the economic impact. I'm not going to talk about the, about the economic impact, but I want to leave something out here. So when we, we always hear the economic impact of COVID. 19, but it's actually, it's not in fact, uh, the COVID-19, but it's preventative measures actually taken to tackle um, the COVID-19. Uh, there's uh, enormous of economic loss um, has led by these measures, including high unemployment rates, shortage of food and supplies, medical services, 
and other necessities. Um, and also those chain effects may, uh, some individual lives, um, talking about some social groups uh, with low uh, socioeconomic uh, level. And how the, do health economics research manage this situation? We know we now we have a health issue and we have a collapsed uh, economy. So it's perfect uh, area for health economics to work on. Um, so to answer this question partially, I actually conducted a rapid literature review to look at the number of applications involving uh, economics uh, from uh, 2014 to 2020. And I only focused on the, the period of time from January 1st to 10th of June. Um, I looked for this article that evaluated the cost effectiveness, cost utility, budget impact, cost benefit analysis on a medical and non-medical interventions. Um, and uh, what I found that there was increase in number of publications that involved health economics uh, analysis uh, from 2014 to, to, uh, to 2019. But in 2020, uh, actually, there was decreased 40% in health economics related publications uh, from 377 to 228 publications. Uh, only 10% of these, this number, which is 228 um, publications involved COVID-19, um, you know, evaluated the cost effectiveness, the cost benefit, whatever, one of these strategies uh, testing, uh, screening, and um, other treatment. So some health economists said this. I mean, the decrease, decreasing number of publications is not actually shocking. We we were actually expecting uh, to see that decrease for uh, so many reasons. I just don't have time to go all of these factors and the reason why we have low attention by health economists in this situation. But the main reason is the um, the human life is uh, priceless. This is what we hear all the time in the media. Uh, you know, all the country's leaders, the government's leaders, they're talking about they, they cannot put a price in human life. Um, so there's no way, there's no place to talk about the cost here, but we they care more about people. Um, so, but, you know, when it comes to the health economics and public health um, or public policy, it's just impossible to think that way because uh, if somebody said, okay, we're gonna put, spend like trillion dollars to, um, you know, per person to save life, you know, we run up money in a day. So what the policymakers do actually, they use what they call life statistical um, value to a set to a, a upper uh, bound for the uh, the cost that we that we impose to for specific regulation to save life. But if that level was pretty high, so we actually would that I mean that would spare us with no money. So that's why we cannot we have to have a value which is a uh, life value. And so let's go back and talk about these measures uh, that have been, you know, implemented by these countries. Uh, do you think they were all effective? Uh, actually, most of the studies said, yeah, uh, they are partially effective. Some of them, they were like pretty much significantly effective. Uh, but some studies said, no, there was have like modest effect. Um, some studies said that would be more effective. It was, it would, it would have, you know, implemented in um, early stages. We know there's stage one and two and three or four or five. Of the pandemic, uh, pandemic stages. So, you know, in the stage one, usually, you know, you know, there's a few number of infected people, you can control them, you know, the source of infection. So it's pretty, pretty much control, uh, uh, you can control that, yeah, I mean. But um, in the, what, you know, what the country dealing with right now is stage four and five, which is it's very hard to control. So pretty much we can summarize that in the uh, very effective um, um, measures. Um, but what the most effective measures? So this is varied between studies. Some studies said, um, you know, the social distancing, aggressive social dis uh, distancing, not aggressive, will be more effective. Depends on country and, and stages of the of the pandemic. <clears throat> but now we go down to the ugly question. I call it the ugliest question ever in these days. Uh, are these measures are cost effective? Um, there's a debate between among the, the health economists. 
uh, some of them said, okay, this is like, it's immature to go ahead and evaluate the cost effectiveness of these measures at this time. And we have to wait until the end of this uh, situation. Maybe uh, some of them, they think that, okay, it's obvious, um, you know, but let me tell you this, um, there is a lot of, you know, the trillion of dollars lost in the economy and there is still encountered um, number of lives uh, hang in balance. Um, I think um, the answer is obvious. But I mean, why we are here, why we actually in very collapsed economy and we still the number of cases is increasing trend. Uh, because what policymakers do when they implement any um, intervention or control measure, they, they only think about the capacity of healthcare system. This is a major reason why they try, you know, uh, they only focus in that level. You know, they do whatever whatever they could just to keep that infected cases under that line because this this line is where they can actually provide appropriate care. They have the medical supplies and everything. But once this number actually exceeds this number this line, uh, there would be a more mortality rate because they would not be able to, uh, uh, you know, provide the appropriate care. The um, you know the number of beds, ventilators, and stuff like that. So the mortality rate would be high. Um, so there is no, you know, they don't generalize the impact, the economic impact of these uh, measures. And also, there is no cost effectiveness um, discussion going on while they're implementing these measures. You, as you all know, that um, health and healthcare economy, uh, components actually contribute to the, um, the economy cost. Uh, some studies found that between 10 to 25 reduction of infected cases would lead to a uh, 20 to 60 percent loss of economy, economic cost. But so that's mean, that means that uh, no, um, means I don't want you to get confused here, because you said okay, we reduce the number of affected cases, but we are still losing money. Yes, because to reduce that, you know, that percentage of cases, um, that would, you know, we need measures, aggressive measures to do that. And these aggressive measures actually would affect other market would affect the whole population the whole economy uh, like uh cancer treatment like we don't target the you know sometimes the the, the, the treatment didn't target the the, the cancer cells but also it would can would affect other uh, healthy cells as well so that's why we the patient would experience more adverse effects and stuff like that and some health economists said uh these percentages or estimate did not take into account that that what are called the health-related opportunity costs. Um, what I mean by that, you know, um, that mortality and mobility that from non-COVID-19, like for example, reduced and delayed health services, uh, postponed visits and su uh, surgeries, um, that would lead to more mobilities for people with chronic conditions, for example. Um, and then uh, that's exactly what you saw in England. Uh, uh, 6,082 uh, all caused death, um, more compared to the uh, past uh, five years uh, in, in the end of, in the 3rd of April, uh, 2020. That was uh, just an estimation, but it's, it's also an effect. I mean, it's a, it's a fact that we call it a crowding out effect, uh, where the country actually, or government, they focus to tackle the COVID-19, but a little focus in other, um, you know, non-communicable uh, conditions, chronic conditions, even in some infectious disease sometimes. Uh, before we estimate the cost effectiveness of any intervention, we have to have some information ready. Uh, for example, a type of measures. Uh, we have to have, we have to know that we are, are we implementing low or high level of control level um, measures. Uh, Short-term or long-term capacity of healthcare care system. Um, because since I mean, if you have if you are prepared and you have a very high or very good capacity of healthcare system, so you probably you don't even uh, you won't uh, care much about the number of infected uh, people at that time. But and also long term uncertainty uh, of virus mutation, expected time of development of vaccines. Um, because if you know this vaccine will be developed in two months, so there is no reason for you to go ahead and do the cost effectiveness analysis because maybe. Some country will be would handle will handle that uh, economy loss, uh, but when, if you know the vaccine will be developed not earlier than ten months or maybe a year from now, uh, here where you have to do the cost effectiveness analysis because 
there's no economy in any country will handle that, um, you know, handle the effect of these measures. Um, and so discounting is another um, topic they have, you have to focus on. The value of flights, as I said, you have to set the value uh, of flight based on what it needs to pay uh, of risk reduction. A very good example of those countries that actually implemented the cost effectiveness, or maybe they performed the cost effective uh, analysis for the control measure is uh, Singapore, for example. And so they, they kept the number of cases under 10 uh, in the first uh, 50 days from the first case. So with only with mild uh, control measure, uh, that only led them to lose about 0.5% in crime, which is very good. So now it's time really to push the reset button. How will we do that? We have to understand all these measures that are implemented by all these countries actually been there for over 100 years. Um, the reason why, I mean, it, it's, it's just, um, I don't know how we do think that these, these measures have been implementing or developed actually 100, 100 years ago, and then you actually you apply it in the, on the current situation, on, um, you know, in the, um, what you see right now. So these measures actually cannot, uh, maybe it's not valid anymore, because now we are living in different era with different people, different characteristics. Um, different lifestyle, uh, and also with this very successful built-up economy, and uh, we have to develop our own multiple st uh, standardized, uh, calibrated, validated control measures. Uh, not only that, but also we have to assess the cost benefit of these developed uh, measures. And at the same time, also we have to implement uh, these measures the right time in the specific location. So just this is just an example to show you that if we have the measure A, B, C, D, E, and F, um, where you, you, you set cost and unit outcome for every uh, for every measure, and you, you actually evaluate the cost effectiveness for all these measures, and the outcome can you know it, it depends on your priority at the time. It may include the reduction in COVID nineteen cases, maybe mortality rate, maybe recovery rate. It depends uh, what you're looking at at that time. And uh, also the cost, you may be also be able to evaluate the overall cost, the effectiveness cost ratio, which is very important. Um, and then based on this analysis, you will be able to pick or to choose the best or maybe uh, the most efficient uh, measure that you can apply in a specific country and a specific city. But to do all this analysis, you have to have this information to be implemented in your model. Uh, for example, the stage of epidemic, I just mentioned there are stages for any pandemic. One, two, three, four, you know, you have to know where, where, where you're at so you'll be able to um, react to that. And you have to have the number of cases uh, infected. Not only this, but you also you have to understand the symptoms of that disease, uh, how similar or different from other viral respiratory diseases. We all know all the viral respiratory diseases, they have the same symptoms, but they only different maybe in the, in the intensity of these symptoms. Um, the duration, intensity, uh, also important. It differs between uh, each, uh, uh, each group of patients. Uh, symptomatic, symptomatic trans, uh, infection, transmitted disease, targeted patients with a testing or treatment. Um, risk factors, we have to know all these risk factors uh, to predict, you know, based on type, intensity, duration of these symptoms, to predict maybe the outcomes like uh, death. Um, so lesson learned from uh, Robert uh, McNamara, he, he was the US uh, Defense uh, Secretary in, in 1960. And uh, I'm not gonna go the whole story again, but I will, you know, what, what we learned from this guy, and he, he was president actually at the World Bank, I think in 1980, something like that. Um, but what we learned from this guy, he was only depend, you know, his decision um, always uh, was according to data. So he was always focusing and collecting data uh, to uh, make decisions in his in the war, especially in Vietnam. So uh, then the economy actually adopted his philosophy into this uh, phrase. The first step is to measure whatever can be easily measured. This is okay as far as it goes. The second step is to uh, disregard that which can be easily measured uh, or to give it uh, a literary uh, quantitative value. This is artificial and misleading. The third step is to presume that what can be measured easily really is important. Uh, and this is uh, blindness. The fourth step is to say what, um, what can be easily measured really doesn't exist. And uh, this is a suicide.
So decisions have to be data driven. Um, it, there is no excuse anymore that we don't have data uh, work on your data, so you will make better decision. Uh, to combat uh, the pandemic uh, situation with lower impact in economy, um, this is exactly what Singapore did. Uh, they actually um, they would have done the health economics uh, uh, analysis to inform decision about the most efficient, comprehensive, and feasible strategies. This analysis ideally could be done maybe before the outbreaks, but also you can do it during the outbreak. Uh, the cost effectiveness analysis should be priority research in general. So as you, you know, said, I just showed you that the number of publications is very low. So we have to, more, you know, uh, fund this type of research in the future, maybe in the, these days too. The government is likely to set up emergency decision-making organization. This is what Singapore did. Um, they they actually uh, developed what are called task force, and this task force actually was tested in the era of Zika and H1N1, and now look what they are doing. They're doing very good. They learned from the lessons. They got their weapons ready. They know what they're expecting. Um, we we all country had to do the same thing. Had to to follow the same uh, strategy. Uh, and that's uh, my uh, presentation, and thank you for your attention, and here's my contact information if you, in case you have any questions.